Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. So alhamdulillah we've got two amazing guests tonight, Muhammad Hijab and Hamza Zotsis. And we're going to have what I anticipate is going to be a really edifying and inspiring program. But before we start, we would like to have a qira'ah. And it was supposed to be from a local qari, but that local qari really liked how Muhammad Hijab himself read. So he decided to confer the honors onto him to recite the, the qira'ah. <sighs> أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم آمن الرسول بما أنزل إليه من ربه والمؤمنون كل آمن بالله وملائكته وكتبه ورسله لا نفرق بين أحد من رسله وقالوا سمعنا وأطعنا وفرانك ربنا وإليك المصير لا يكلف الله نفسا إلا وسعها لها ما كسبت وعليها ما اكتسبت ربنا لا تؤاخذنا إن نسينا أو أخطأنا ربنا ولا تحمل علينا إسرا كما حملته على الذين من قبلنا ربنا ولا تحملنا ما لا طاقة لنا به واعف عنا واغفر لنا وارحمنا أنت مولانا فانصرنا على القوم الكافرين صدق الله عليه ما شاء الله ما شاء الله that was a really moving recitation uh, before I go about introducing our two guest speakers the chairman of the IPCI Dr. Muhammad Khan would just like to say a few words of welcome and personally thank all of you and the two guest speakers Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. On behalf of IPCI, I have the honor and privilege to welcome our guest all the way from UK. And I know one of the speakers is from the Hyde Park Corner, Speaker's Corner, and has experience with engagement with other religious organization and I would like to welcome each one of you to this evening's program and I don't want to take much of your time but just to thank you and also the organizers who have organized this function. Thank you. <clears throat> Jazakallah for that. So before we begin we've got to do a customary introduction and why I say it's customary because I think everyone here knows who these two gentlemen are. They are, you know, there's no need for an introduction when it comes to Muhammad Hijab and Hamza Zotsis. But just by way of formality, if I had to explain to you the impact that they've had on the world, on the Muslim world at large, I'd say that, you know, from the time of the Sahaba radiallahu anhum, the Muslim Ummah has always faced intellectual attacks. People who wanted to assault and assail the orthodox Islamic position. And in every one of these eras, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chose certain individuals to stand up and defend the Islamic cause. And in the beginning of the 21st century, in the first decade, a new age atheism using social media had began to create doubts in the minds of believers the world over. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala handpicked certain individuals to defend the deen. And alhamdulillah, these two scholars, these two, uh, these two gentlemen are from amongst those people who have defended the deen that through their writings, through their debates, through the content that they've produced, they have played a huge role in stemming the tide of 
uh, the secular Western liberal mindset. And they've trained an entire generation of youngsters to be confident in their deen, to be confident about de defending the orthodox Islamic positions. And they personally have, you know, taken it upon themselves to go out and challenge those people who are attacking Islam. And who doesn't know the famous debate with Hamza and Lawrence Krauss? I think he's got over 5 million views on YouTube. Or Muhammad Ijab when he absolutely humiliated David Wood on YouTube. Who hasn't seen those, you know? Those are iconic moments for all Muslims around the world. And so, you know, we, they've got a lot to offer us and we've got a lot to learn. They've represented Islam on the highest platforms. Alhamdulillah, they've done all of us proud. When it comes to qualifications, then the way Hamza put it, I think, is that Muhammad Ijab has more degrees than a thermometer. He has a master's degree in history, he has a master's degree in uh, is Islamic studies, he has a master's degree in philosophy, he has a bachelor's degree in politics, he is still studying for his PhD in philosophy, he's still studying at Al-Azhar as well at the same time. He's also studied under so many traditional scholars, Hanbali Aqidah, Hanbali Fiqh, Tafsir, Hadith, Usul al-Hadith, all of the traditional subjects he studied as well. And if we look at Brother Hamza, He's studied, so he's, he has many postgraduate qualifications in philosophy. He's uh, studying for his PhD as well. He's written an amazing book called The Divine Reality. I really recommend that everyone reads that book. It's been translated into 10 languages. He was the CEO of IERA, one of the leading Dawah organizations in the world. If you look at their website, I think they're getting over 100 shahadas a day. And he's also a trained boxing expert and a Wing Chun Kung Fu master. So we have a lot to learn from him. Uh, <laughs> So, and both of them have started uh, this website called Sapiens Institute, it's an, and I would really also recommend that everyone checks that out. There's such beneficial content there to, for us to further our learning as Muslims. We're all going to go on this journey of ilm. And Sapiens Institute, which they both have co-founded, is one of the best websites you can use for that. So the way the program is going to work is, I'm not sure who's speaking first, but the speakers are going to speak one after the other. Then we're going to open the floor up for Q&A. After that, there's going, at about half past eight, we'll stop with that. Then there's going to be some tea and desserts. And then at nine o'clock, Isha Jama'a will take place in the building next door, in the Musalla next door, uh, where, the, where the new radio station is. We're going to go down there. And, and at about 9 p.m., the Isha Jama'a will take place at that time. So without further ado, whichever one of you guys is speaking first can come up. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. I like to thank IPCI for facilitating such an amazing event, and I like to thank every single one of you for participating. And obviously, and fundamentally, and ultimately, I like to thank Allah سبحانه وتعالى. For making this happen because it's a very important event. We're going to be talking about liberalism, feminism, and the LGBTQ plus ideology. So my initial presentation is going to be on the LGBTQ plus ideology. It's called Reclaiming the Rainbow. And it is evident, my dear brothers and Mashaikh, that society has waged a full-on attack against the family, against the gender and moral and necessary social hierarchies that have existed for millennia and obviously are expressed best and optimally through the Islamic tradition. And the weapon that has been used is this ideology. So the main objective, my dear brothers and mashayikh, is to unpack five major assumptions of this ideology so it can empower you to understand why it is actually false. But before I get into that, I just want to remind everybody about the ethical position that we take with regards to our ideological enemies. It doesn't necessarily follow that just because someone's an ideological enemy that now you have to assert yourself physically in a way that discriminates, in a way that is violent. And the Quran has these nuanced positions in Surah Mumtahana 
chapter 60 verse 8 Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says Allah does not forbid you from dealing kindly and fairly with those who have neither fought nor driven you out of your homes surely Allah loves those who are fair and interestingly Allah uses the form of the word bir which we know means righteousness and it's used in the context of the Quran in chapter 19 verse 32 with regards to piety and intense goodness to one's mother so it's very important for us to understand that yes we are ideologically poles apart but I'm going to be fair to you I'm going to be righteous towards you and this is why we shouldn't fall for the kind of neoliberal neo postmodern trap that just because you disagree with someone you may disagree with the conception of rights it doesn't mean that now I'm going to be violent against you or discriminate in a way that actually harms you because our main role as Muslims is to do what? is to be what? is to be beacons of light to show the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the mercy of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam manifested in a form of guidance we want to awaken the truth within we want people to be guided to the truth so they have an optimal and pure life in this world and they have eternal bliss in the hereafter is that clear? so the first thing I want to say is this every truth claim has assumptions every truth claim every postulation every idea has a set of assumptions now these assumptions can be grounded in truth and they could be coherent or they could be incoherent and not grounded in any truth let me give you an example the secularist mantra slogan church and state must be separate what are the assumptions behind this there are a few assumptions but let's unpack one of them this essentially argues that God and religion is unable to govern societies that's the assumption here essentially it's articulating that secularism has its own epistemological and metaphysical biases meaning how they see the world the nature of political discourse the nature of governing people can only be understood by referring it to secularism itself and essentially saying that religion including Islam does not have the principles the framework the moral and legal reasoning to actually govern societies that include people who are described as the other and this is totally false another assumption is that this mantra secularism itself assumes the distinct and mutually exclusive categories of the political and the religion secularism has this metaphysical narcissism it projects itself onto reality and it's basically saying I'm going to strip away the political I'm going to strip away the ability to govern from anything other than myself which is also false because it assumes that secularism is, it is the only thing able to govern societies with different people with distinct groups and religion is, can only be reduced to the private affairs and I would argue humbly I blame our Christian brothers and friends and humanity with regards to this render unto Caesars what is Caesars and render unto God's what is God's which is basically saying God does not have the ability to guide human beings to govern the affairs of all human beings what kind of God is this? limited, contingent, unable this is not the Islamic tradition so let's go to the LGBTQ plus assumptions so it, the ideology maintains this in a broad sense same-sex intercourse and gender fluidity is not immoral 
and it is a right. Now this claim has a range of assumptions. Assumption number one, human beings ultimately own their own bodies. And I'm going to unpack these assumptions for you. Number two, same-sex intercourse and gender fluidity is a fundamental individual right. Number three, same-sex intercourse and gender fluidity does not have any wrong-making features. It's not immoral. Number four, sexuality and desires form one's identity. Finally, sexuality, gender, is a social construct. There are no biological markers. Now, within the LGBTQ plus ideology and its advocates, there's disagreement amongst these assumptions. Some would adopt maybe the last two assumptions. Some may adopt all of them, even, even though some of them may contradict. The point is, in the broad school of the LGBTQ plus ideology and its advocates, you're going to find that they follow some of these assumptions, a few of them, if not all of them. So let's unpack the first assumption. Humans own their own bodies. Now fundamentally and generally speaking, they would argue there is no creator, which is an atheistic assumption, although there are religious people who believe in a creator that adopt this assumption too, but we're going to have a side note for that in a moment. Inshallah, God willing. They argue there is no creator and we don't owe anything to that creator. We're not duty bound. And we live in a materialistic universe and the human being emerged from a lengthy biological process. We've been reduced to the primordial soup. Carbon just rearranged in different ways. Electrons just whizzing around, which doesn't give any man any honor with all due respect. But nevertheless, we haven't been created according to them, and therefore we own our own bodies. It's my body, my body, my choice. You hear that a lot amongst the pro abortion advocates, which is a slogan, it's a rhetorical trap. And we should basically say, Where is your proof for such a claim? Where is your proof? Because our understanding that's based on truth is it's not your body at all. It is fundamentally owned by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So when they say they own their own bodies, they say we have every right to do whatever we want with our bodies as long as it doesn't harm anyone. And obviously they have a particular definition of harm. Now some religious people may believe in God and therefore they may believe ultimately God owns our bodies. But they will make the argument, well God allows us to do whatever we want as long as it doesn't harm anyone, which is a kind of liberal assumption with its own normative ethical theories that are away from any Abrahamic discourse. The second assumption is an individual right. It's an individual right. Forget owning your body, forget this, that and the other. We live in a liberal society, in a secular society, and the law has said that it is your right same-sex intercourse it's something that you're allowed to do it's within the law it's legal gender fluidity is totally fine and acceptable this is part of what we call individual rights now we don't reject individual rights we have this notion in our tradition called hukuk al-ibad the rights of the individual but we would say why are you assuming your conception of rights is universal and absolute who gave you that right to play God? Are you external to the universe? You can make the universal moral claim? Who are you? You limited, contingent creature with limited cognitive faculties that has been infected and molested by your own shahawat, your own blameworthy desires. You've made yourself into a God, my friend. Unacceptable unacceptable and therefore what we would say is well who has the right to give us our rights you or Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the other assumption is 
that there are no wrong making features. It's not wrong to have same sex intercourse. It's not wrong to have gender fluidity. And we would say, where's your proof? And they would say, well, we know that good and bad is based upon the maximum happiness for the maximum number of people, which is a normative ethical theory called utilitarianism. It's a consequentialist theory. It looks at the consequence or the impact of a moral action. And they use the limited understanding, the limited understanding of the, the future, if you like. The moral domino, the moral dominoes falling and they make an assessment. And they say, well, there's nothing wrong with same-sex intercourse. There's nothing wrong with gender fluidity because we believe things are wrong or right based on what? The maximum number of pleasure and happiness for the maximum number of people. So if it reduces happiness or increases suffering, then that is evil. And this is based on a particular assumption, a moral assumption. It's a normative ethical theory called consequentialism. Now, we don't have to unpack this in too much detail, but generally speaking, the Western civilization bases its moral truths, if you like, on two main normative ethical theories. Utilitarianism, the maximum number of happiness for the maximum number of people, the maximum pleasure for the maximum number of people, that's what's good. And if you reduce that happiness or you increase suffering for people, then that is evil. Then you have another thing called deontological ethics. Deontological ethics is not really about the consequences of your moral action. It's using your intellect to form certain criteria to understand moral duties. That we have a duty to do X and we have a duty to, to do Y irrespective of the consequences. And we don't need to go too much into this because I'm going to leave this for Muhammad Hijab to unpack. But it's an idea that you need to understand that when they make a moral claim, it's based on a particular moral theory. And in the Western discourse, it's usually utilitarianism or deontological ethics. Now, one would argue you also have ethical egoism, which is also a consequence of this theory. It talks about the consequences of moral action, but not based on the maximum number of people. It doesn't say maximum pleasure for the maximum number of people. What it says is, Maximum pleasure for you as an individual. Ethical egoism. But the thing that you need to understand is this. We don't need to unpack this too much philosophically. Just understand. When they make a claim that there is nothing immoral about same-sex intercourse, there's nothing immoral about their LGBT, LGBT, LGBTQ plus ideology. They're making it difficult for us. And there's nothing wrong with gender fluidity. It's based upon a certain ethical theory, utilitarianism, maybe ethical egoism, deontological ethics. And we would ask, why do you think those are true? I don't have to adopt your normative ethical theory. We have our own ethical theory, divine command theory. Allah's commands are the best for us, which we'll unpack in a few moments. So the other assumption is my dear brothers and sisters, sorry, there's no sisters here, I do apologize. My dear, oh, there are sisters. Okay, sorry, I do apologize. I see, mashallah, lowering your gaze. Yeah, we're lowering our gaze, you know, in both senses of the phonetic term the gaze and the gaze. <laughs> the other assumption is that sexuality and gender is a social construct. It's not based on any biological markers. Now, this is based on something called queer theory. Okay? Note this down. Queer theory. Now, queer theory is basically an extension of postmodernism, which I'm going to discuss very briefly. But queer theory 
was motivated by the uncontroversial and justified point that says who we are is not just biology. This is called biological essentialism. That our biological traits or DNA or physical makeup dictate who we are. This has been refuted. And this is well known even in the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. But the mainstream view is that there is a combination of biological traits, DNA, physical makeup, and society or some kind of socialization or nurturing. It's a combination. What queer theory does, it literally cuts the umbilical cord between the physical makeup, DNA, biology, and socialization. It says it's just socialization. It's all a social construct. And queer theory is essentially based on postmodern principles. So postmodernism is very hard to define, but you could reduce it to certain principles. There are a few, but we, could only, we only need to talk about two in this context. The first one is radical skepticism. Postmodernism argues that there is no method to obtain objective truths about reality. And this is like a commitment to cultural constructivism. Meaning it's just a cultural construct. We're radically skeptic about truth claims. And this was based on Foucault's kind of understanding of power. Foucault, who was a khabith, nasty piece of work who's ref that he's referred to. He's a, he is seen as like one of the modern founders of queer theory and postmodern discourse. He's seen as an intellectual giant amongst those circles. But he was raping young Algerian boys in graveyards. Trust me, you could trace these ideas to people who are fundamentally... They're not even human. They're like the bottom, you know the bottom of a dustbin. You scrape that muck. That's what they are, they're that muck. I'm not trying to dehumanize them. I'm just saying from the character point of view. How can you rape boys in graveyards? What's the matter with you? And he was so obsessed with sexuality. He actually wrote many volumes on the history of Western sexuality. <laughs> he fetishized sexuality. Honestly. And they respect him. Look who he was. Look who we follow. The Prophet ﷺ, the highest moral character, the best human being to have walked this earth. Look who they follow. Someone who raped young Algerian boys in graveyards. Come on. You don't need to be a, a philosopher or sophisticated to find out how dumb, stupid, incoherent, unhuman these ideas are. So how do we apply radical skepticism to queer theory? So they say biology, therefore gender, is a social construct that is produced through the power structures in society and language. It's got nothing to do with biological markers. Any form of biological truth, any truth about gender that we know that's normative is just a form of socialization. The second postmodern principle it's about social hierarchies, which I briefly mentioned about Foucault. They say that society is based on systems of social hierarchies and power. These decide what is known and how knowledge can be obtained. And that's why Foucault had this idea of discourses. You, power is not like something on top of you, it's like a grid. Power is accessible everywhere. And people who hold the power structures or the social hierarchies and the discourses, the language that you use is the one that's going to shape what is known and what is not to be known, what is true and what is not true. And they say because truth, because what can be known or not known is, is socialized and pro propagated, if you like, and constructed through language, which Foucault called discourses, then they're radically skeptical about this, all of this stuff. And they also are skeptical or they believe social hierarchies are unjust forms of power. Or they could be sources of oppression and queer theorists argue violence. So how do we apply this socialization or social constructivism to queer theory? Well, queer theory argues that fixed categories of heterosexual or male, female and 
normative terms concerning sexuality are forms of oppression because you put them in categories there's a power structure that develops that language and puts it in categories and that power structure itself is using that language to dictate what can be known or not known this is a source of oppression they argue and therefore they say that this is built by social narratives perpetuated by language and queer theory argues this is violence and before we go to the next assumption there are some key thinkers of postmodernism and queer theory you don't have to know them in detail we already spoke about Michel Foucault who was a French philosopher why can you reduce nasty ideas to French thinkers I don't know what's going on he wrote The Order of Things, Discipline and Punishment, The Birth of the Prison, Madness and Civilizations, and The History of Sexuality, which is a multi-volume history of Western sexuality. And some of his key ideas we've mentioned, but he says that ide his ideas center on power and what we know to be true are just constructions of language, which he called discourses. And his work has become canonical for queer theorists. You have uh, Jacques uh, Derrida, a French philosopher, he wrote of grammatology, writing and difference, and speech and phenomena. And his ideas are simply this, because a Derridian understanding of language is quite important for postmodernists and queer theorists, because they say that language can be a source of oppression and, and power, and it's used unjustly. And they also say language, from a Derridian perspective, language doesn't represent reality. Language is just relational. The words you use don't represent reality. They just make sense within themselves. So they say they're inherently biased and oppressive. For example, a derided understanding of language would say, when you say what is the opposite of male, we say female. Ah, male, female's opposite of male. There's the hierarchy. So these two terms are relational. One's on top, one's in the bottom, generally speaking. And that's why he developed this term called phalagocentrism phalagocentrism was the argument that in western language and discourse it's inherently pro-male it favors the masculine hierarchy therefore it is oppressive and you have the works of simone de beauvoir she was a feminist philosopher but she was also an existential philosopher her great work not great in terms of praising it but in terms of popularity it's called the second sex and she essentially argues that someone is not born a woman, they become a woman. And what it means to be a woman is not just a biological fact. She facilitates the idea that the sex you are assigned is not the same as the sex that you can become. And although she wasn't a queer theorist, but she delivered the initial ideas for queer theory to develop. You have Gail Rubin, who is an anthropologist. She wrote, The Traffic in Women, Note on the political economy of sex and thinking sex notes for a radical theory of the politics of sexuality. And basically she argues that family is just there, the family structure, the normative understanding of what it means to be a family and that hierarchy is just there just to reproduce gender and to make heterosexuality seem normal. And she allowed the idea that gender could be reproduced and there are systems in place to control that gender norms male and female are repressive she argues and she says that we conform to them judith butler who's alive she's a philosopher her famous work was gender trouble feminism and the subversion of identity she prevents presents the idea of gender performativity which is really the key philosophy if you like of what's happening now with the transgender movement she argues that there, there are no biological traits that dictate your gender or your sexuality. And she calls this gender performativity. Now, it's not a performance that you act like, a, like an actor, but rather it's like the social hierarchy and the language that you use allows you to become that thing. So she would argue, for example, in a legal context or in a Christian context, when the priest says, and he has a legal authority, I now announce you man and wife. By virtue of his authority, the social hierarchy, by virtue of the language that he's using, they become man and wife automatically. Five seconds ago, they were not man and wife. So by virtue of the structure, hierarchy, and the language used, you can perform a gender or perform a role. So she argues 
disturb the social hierarchies, agitate them, break them down, disturb the language, change the language, therefore you have more freedom and you can make up any gender you want. So we know, and the other assumption which we need to quickly talk about is that your identity is formed with, by your desires. That's a key, key aspect here. That's a key assumption of the LGBTQ plus philosophy that my desires are going to form my identity. So let's quickly unpack them. I should just be another five minutes, inshallah, from an Islamic perspective. Do humans fundamentally own their own bodies? Who owns our bodies? Allah. So we disagree with that assumption. We disagree with the assumption that humans ultimately own their own bodies. Allah created us, Allah owns us as an aspect of His creative agency and power, an aspect of His rububiyyah. And therefore, He has every right to tell us what to do with our bodies because it belongs to Him and we have a duty to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Is this clear? Let's unpack the second assumption from an Islamic perspective. Same-sex intercourse and gender fluidity is a fundamental individual right. No. According to whose conception of rights? Your rights are not universal. They come from a liberal individualistic paradigm. We say that the true universal right is, the one who is from the one who created the whole universe. Whose commands are based on his goodness, his al-bar, the source of all goodness. He is Al-Rahman, the intensely merciful. He is Al-Wudud, the loving. He is external to the universe. He can make the universal moral claim. He can make the claim about rights. He is Al-Alim, Al-Hakim. He is the knowing, the wise. He has the picture. We just got the pixel. So when Allah commands something or says something and gives our rights, He has every right to do so because He owns us. He has every right to do so because he is the source of all goodness and the ultimate authority. As Allah says in the Quran in chapter 7 verse 28, Indeed, Allah does not order immorality. Do you say about Allah that which you do not know? The other assumption that we want to mention is that they claim that desires form your identity. This is so not true. You may have a desire to be maybe homosexual. But that could be unpacked and you could have some mentoring and you could change that desire, which is well known in the psychological discourse. That's why they're trying, to, they're trying to ban that type of therapy. But notwithstanding, in the Islamic tradition, desires do not form our identity. What forms our identity is that we are worshippers of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah says in the Quran in chapter 2 verse 138, this is the natural way, the fitrah, this is the natural way of Allah. And who is better than Allah than, than Allah in ordaining a way? Sorry, the word fitra is used in chapter 30, verse 30, not in this context. And we worship none but Him. So our primary identity is not our desires, it's the fact that we've been created by Allah and we're here to worship Him, which means to love Him, to know Him, to obey Him, to submit to Him, to glorify Him, and to direct, to direct all internal and external acts of worship to Allah alone. Also, we know that following your desires that are not guided by Allah, that are not in line with Islam, are actually blameworthy. As Allah says in the Quran in chapter 28 verse 50, And who is more astray than the one who follows his desire without guidance from Allah? Indeed, Allah does not guide the wrongdoing people. And so this is very, very important for us to understand, my dear brothers and sisters. The other assumption... Gender, sexuality is just a social construct. Yes, we don't agree with biological essentialism, but it's just biology. There's a combination of both. Socialization, nurturing, social nurturing, guidance, and biology. And we know this from the son of the Prophet wasallam. But we totally and categorically reject that it's just socialization. There is something within us biologically that Allah has created and from a fitra perspective that actually dictates our gender and sexuality. And Allah makes it clear. It's a binary world, the male and the female. And the male is not like the female. 
And this is supported by psychological, anthropological, and biological evidence. And the way to disturb this assumption is to produce its absurdities. If we follow through the queer theory postmodern discourse, I could just say this. If biological markers do not dictate who I am with regards to sexuality, gender, or even my identity itself, then from now on I announce I am a bushy-tailed cat. Meow. Meow. You can, if you're consistent with postmodernism, if you're consistent with queer theory, then I'm a bushy-tailed cat. Oh, one minute. Gender performativity. If you follow that narrative, all of a sudden, now, I am a six foot seven Egyptian handsome articulate eloquent man. Right? My features don't count. My biological traits don't count. Or, and to be a little bit more controversial, since color, biology doesn't dictate who I am, I can say this. Brothers and sisters and friends, henceforth, I want to be called Sambina. My name is Sambina. I am a black lesbian. Ah ah. Eh eh. I am a black lesbian. I could say that, right? According to their theory, I don't want to offend anyone. I'm trying to show the absurdity of the discourse. What makes it even worse, my dear brothers and sisters, is that they claim that social hierarchy and language are forms of oppression that must be fought and disturbed. They believe oppression, injustice is objective. But they follow the postmodern principle that there is no method to come to an objective truth. That should also include their so-called notion of objective justice and objective oppression. It's a contradiction. Finally, brothers and sisters and friends, they argue that sexual, sex, sexual intercourse with the same gender and gender fluidity does not have any wrong-making features. And we would just argue something very simple. Yes, they do. We don't adopt utilitarianism or ethical egoism or deontological ethics. We adopt divine command theory, what Allah and His Messenger have said. And we already explained that Allah can make the universal moral claim. Allah is not limited. His knowledge and wisdom are maximally perfect without any deficiency and flaw. He is the source of all goodness. He is Al Rahman, Al Rahim, He is Al Bar, He is Al Alim, He is Al Hakim. And when he commands, it's in line with who he is. Therefore, it's always going to be good for us and society from an individual, social, and political perspective. Also, Allah has the complete moral picture by virtue of, of Allah's nature with regards to his names and attributes. Allah has the picture, we got the pixel. He knows everything we don't. He knows the full moral consequences of everything. Also, he is the ultimate judge. And we have a duty towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He is the ultimate authority. He is the source of all goodness. And He is the only being worthy of worship. And part of worship is that we obey Allah. We are duty bound to Allah to obey His commands. Now obviously, and this is a key point for you who want to give da'wah. All of this depends on the fact that we believe in Allah and His revelation. So when you show the Islamic take on these assumptions, tell them, and this is true, because the Quran, the Sunnah, Allah's existence, His oneness, revelation and prophethood are true. And what they say about these things are also true. Because they come from the ultimate authority. Now, they would respond to us and say, well, there is a dilemma here. You threefold dilemma. Why are you obeying divine commands? It doesn't make any sense. Like recently in the debate that we had in Johannesburg, this uh, Oppenheimer who basically was uh, intellectually nuclear bombed by this beloved gentleman. And I had a little bit of sprinkling as well. I supported that, I facilitated that in some, to some degree. But he was totally annihilated when he was said, why should I follow the, essentially the religion of the white man, the ethics of the white man? Was John Locke Nigerian? Why? Where's your proof that these things are objective and true? Oh, morality. Right? And then he shut up for the whole, the whole debate. He was quiet like a mouse. He was like, quiet like a mouse. Maybe I should identify as that cat and eat him alive. Meow! Oppenheimer the mouse. <laughs> so they say you three-fourths dilemma applies. And this is the dilemma. 
Is it good because Allah commanded it? Or is it good because the commands of Allah are good? Now if it's good because Allah commanded it, then they say it's arbitrary. Allah could command for you to kill everyone over the age of 60 and therefore it would be morally good. So it doesn't work. Then they would say, if you choose, is it good because the commands of Allah are good, then good is an external reference point. That good is external to God himself. We reject this. It's a false dilemma. It's pathetic. Originally, this dilemma, Euthyphus' dilemma was about polytheism anyway. Why is it a false dilemma? Because we accept the first horn, which is it's good because Allah commanded it, but we reject the assumption. We reject the assumption that Allah's commands are dislocated away from his nature. Because we could deal with it in the following way, which is an argument that came from Shah Wali Allah al Dahlawi in his conclusive argument for God's existence. And basically, I'm just summarizing in a modern context. And the argument is as follows Allah's commands manifested in the Islamic moral and legal, and legal, Islamic moral and legal principles and theory addresses the moral needs of human beings on a personal, social, and political level. The commands of Allah are like a key that perfectly fit into a lock that opens the door to the functioning and well-being for individuals and society. A key is designed for a lock. And just like the key is designed for a lock, the commands of Allah are designed for our well-being. Therefore, it's completely irrational and absurd to claim that Allah's commands are arbitrary. To argue such a thing is equivalent of claiming that a specific key that opens a specific door was not designed. So I know I've gone a little bit too much, but let me just, literally three minutes, and you hold me to account on these three minutes, inshallah. They would argue and say, look, don't force your assumption on us. Congratulations, this is where we want you. You're the one who's been putting this ideology across the world, behind money and power and even violence. You've been pushing this ideology down our throats. Leave our children alone. Leave us alone. Do what you want in your bedroom. I'm not saying it's right. You're still going to go to hell for it if you don't believe in Allah. But leave us alone. Stop being such disgusting, shaitanic human beings that you want to change our children. Gender affirming care. What does that mean? I'm going to cut off your genitalia. I'm going to make it into a vagina. With all due respect, I apologize, sisters. That's what happens. If you see some of the pictures, you'll faint. Gender affirming care, and they were complaining about circumcision. <laughs> this little small piece of skin. But what they do is they get the vagina, they make it to a phallus that doesn't even work. And when it doesn't work, sometimes they take it from the rectum. Yes, and then it grows hairs and it stinks, and they can't do anything, and they want to commit suicide. We should feel sorry for these people out of love, out of genuine care for humanity. These people have gender dysphoria. It's a medical problem, and we should be caring enough to help them. This LGBTQ plus audience doesn't care for them. They don't care for them. They want to destroy them. So, yes, we agree. Don't force assumption on us. And since you understood that you have assumptions too, then maybe you should stand in the possibility that our assumptions that are coherent come from the truth. Let me give doubt to you. Allah is true. His oneness is true. His revelation is true. Prophethood is true. And what they say is true. They also say love is love. This is a nonsensical rhetorical trap trying to make us feel that we're not loving. Muslims are the most loving human beings because we're taught by Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to love for humanity what we love for ourselves in Tariq al-Kabir narrated by Bukhari. Also in the hadith in Arba'een, لا يؤمن, لا يؤمن وحدكم حتى يهب لأخيه ما يهب لنفسه You won't truly believe unless you love for your brother what you love for yourself. And now he says this means humanity as well. That you want good for them and guidance for them. Obviously, we don't love disbelief, but we want good for them and guidance for them. This is a nonsensical trap because love is intentional and directional. You want people's well-being. The LGBTQ plus philosophy, especially the transgender movement, does not want your well-being. They want to destroy and mutilate you. And also, we could just agitate them and say, fine, love is love. Then water is water. Drink from the toilet. And we could say, okay, sex is sex. Make love to a corpse. Food is food. Okay, eat my vomit. Right? They've been having intellectual vomit all this time. Incoherent intellectual postulations and musings, which is equivalent of intellectual vomit that we need to clean up. So, my dear brothers and sisters, this is the end of the presentation. When you know how to unpack the assumptions, you know the Islamic take on those assumptions, don't stop there. 
bring them to Allah. Our assumptions are true, they're coherent, they come from Allah. And let me explain to you who Allah is. He wants good for you. He wants you to be guided. He doesn't want you to go to hell. That's why He sent down revelation. And we could prove the Quran, prove Allah's existence, His oneness, His revelation and prophethood. And what comes from this truth is true. And obviously you're not going to articulate like me with passion and a sense of maybe bordering arrogance. I'm doing this just to get you to think. But, uh, but the art of da'wah is to do what? To call people to Allah, chapter 16, verse 1 to 5, to call people to Allah, to the sabil of Allah with hikmah and hasana. Wisdom, you're applying your ilm in a particular context. You're applying knowledge in a particular context for an Allah-centric goal. We want to awaken the truth within people. We want good for humanity. And we do it with hasana, which, impl which, which implies goodness, righteousness, a sense of love. So if you do it in that way, and you do it with calmness, then I think everything's going to be okay. But now is the time to start doing it. In the next five years, South Africa will be a different place. We don't want it to be there. We want goodness for humanity. And that is our job as Muslims. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. You know, we the Muslims believe that the Quran have all the solutions to all of our problems. And that the Quran is the best form of guidance. So when we talk about homosexuality, the practice of it or the belief of it, or when we talk about feminism, or when we talk about liberalism, in a sense the Quran has dealt with all of those topics. And this actually affirms the timeless moral nature of the Quran al Karim. For example, I was pondering over some verses in the Quran in Surah Al-A'raf. And it's very, very interesting because when the prophets came to the people, they all came and they said, they called them to Tawheed. مَا مِنْ إِلَهٍ غَيْرُهُ That there's no God except for Him, i.e. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then, for example, وَمَدْيًا إِذْ قَالَ لِقَوْمِهِ for example, or Thamud, or, but then when it came to Lut alayhi salam, he didn't actually tell the people to worship Allah. It's a very interesting situation here. He's the only one, if you, this is something you can check. Go on Surah Al-Araf, and you'll see all of the prophets said, مَا مَنْ إِلَهَ غَيْرُ They said, only worship Allah, there's no other God except for him. But Lut alayhi salam, when he came to his people, that wasn't the first thing he said to them. He said to them the following. This is in chapter 7 verse 80. Surah Al-Araf. The first thing Lot said to his people according to the Quran is are you approaching the people with something that nobody before you has done the first thing he challenged them on was this homosexual practices he says you are approaching men in a desirous way in opposition to or other than women you are a people who transgress all bounds it's very interesting the phraseology and we'll come back to it how did they respond to him because all of this is so interesting Allah has placed it in the Quran for a reason so that we can read this as people of the 21st century and take Lessons from this. There's no doubt about that. It wasn't the case that his qawm, his people responded to him except that they said, Remove them from your town. They are a people who seek purification. Now, Let's take it one step back. Let's really analyze these words for a second. Very interesting. 
The first thing is, Lot challenged his people. He said to them, you are a people who prefer women, men over women. In shahwa, he made it very clear. Shahwa means desire. And then he said the following, he said, you are qawmun musrifun. Musrifun means you go overboard. You're going too much now. Now, I was thinking about this tail end of the ayah for many years, actually. And this is not a tafsir, this is tadabbur. I want to just explain what I've been thinking about. You see, in psychology, there is something called replacement theory. Some people call it Romeo and Juliet theory. Very interesting. Especially when it comes to love and sexuality, if you continually tell someone not to do something, sometimes it makes it more desirable for them. And if you say, don't do that, don't do that, don't do that, don't do that, and it's in a sexual context, sometimes it can make them want to do it more. This is the case. This ayah is very interesting because it's not really saying, don't do that, don't do that in that manner. It's saying you're going overboard now. Very interesting. So it doesn't activate that psychological response that someone, it could be argued, could get from that. And obviously in the other part of the, the other interaction with them, Lut said, these, these, this is a, these are my daughters. Effectively, that's the translation. You can marry them. But this daughters, is it the daughters of the village? Is it the daughters? Of, yani, this is a discussion among the scholars. The point is he gave them an alternative. Because sexuality requires an alternative. Sexuality is like a wave. If you stand in front of it, it can swallow you and engulf your life. Sexuality is not something you can try and stop like this. No matter how loudly you shout or what you do. It's something you need to redirect. So we go back. This tail end of the ayah is very interesting. But what is even for me more interesting from a sociological perspective is the response of his people. They only said one thing to him. They didn't care about They don't want to argue with him. They don't care about bring your evidences and they want to argue with you and debate with you. They don't care about all of that, to be honest with you. They're not interested. They only said one thing. Get them out of your city. And it's so interesting, the pronouns here. Get them out of your town. But aren't they all living in the same town? If you want to put it in modern parlance, aren't they all citizens of the same country? Get them out of your country. Because these ones, they want to purify themselves. Which indicates they're not interested in purit purification, effectively. They don't care about purifying themselves, these particular ones. In the Quran, they don't care about purifying themselves. That is, it shows you why he didn't start with Tawheed with them. Because they were fundamentally insincere. He had to break the idol. He had to make sure La ilaha was there before he could put illallah. That they were so entrenched into their own desires that it was clouding any kind of rational discussion. They were not interested in discussion. They were not interested in truth. So if he had said to them, believe in Allah, this would have been too much of an obstacle. So my pondering over the verse is perhaps their desires were so strong that they needed to be deconstructed first. And the response is, get them out of your country. And you'll see how quickly you'll turn from South Africans to Indians when they enact laws. And put this on the record and remember what I said. When they enact laws of hate speech and uh, anti-discrimination laws. When you start speaking about anti-LGBT practices and so on, they say if you do that, they'll copy the West, monkey see, monkey do. This is what South Africa is going to happen. If there's anything you want to predict, you can predict this. You'll see how quickly you go from this country, whatever, to your original country, where you, where you get them out of your city. This is our... This country is a liberal country. This country is about tolerance and inclusion. And if you're not interested in that, then leave. This is what they'll say. Go back to your country. 
And this is already what we're seeing in the West. This country, and they do that in institutions. Your child has to learn this information. Your child must learn inclusion and tolerance and fundamental British or American values. Your child must learn this syllabus. This is undoubtedly exactly what Lut faced, we are facing. But imagine, he was like one person. And he's, he had a small group of family members. And Allah still saved him, except for his wife. كانت من الغابرين. She was, the, she was with those who, she, she sided with those, actually. And you, this actually teaches us another lesson, which is that we're going to lose people in this war. If a prophet of Allah, Hulut alayhi salam, lost his wife in this ideological war, there's no doubt that we are going to lose people in this war. But we need to march ahead. And this was probably more than three to four thousand years ago. And Allah he describes her as a khaina. كانت تحت عبدين من عبادنا فخانتاهما. لوط وضرب الله مثلا امرأة امرأة لوط امرأة نوح وامرأة لوط كانت تحت عبدين من عبادنا فخانتاهما. The two wives of Noah and Lot, they were underneath two of our slaves and they betrayed them. We will find people in our community who exist now who will also betray us. So we have to prepare for that. Who will side with the dominant ethic. Allah is psychologically priming and preparing us, showing us that even our family members, some of them, they will lose, we will lose them in the ranks. Everything is perfect in the Quran. It's telling us exactly what to do in this situation. The guidance is there. We offer alternatives. But Lord, despite the fact that he was one person with small member, number of family members, he still fought against the situation. He said, Lo, If I had the power, I would change the situation. Now we are finding people, Muslim people in leadership positions, who do not have the fortitude and do not have the strength and they should be removed from their leadership position who effectively accept or acquiesce or be quiet to the fact of this immorality. All over the West we have seen it and they have been exposed. Some of them big figures and it took years and years to be stern in speech about this practice. In the same way like Lot was, which is a huge humiliation for them, and they've lost all of their credibility. Lot alayhi salam and the prophets of Allah have given us the answers. The answer is you're gonna give dawah. And the dawah with homosexuality starts with the discussion of the elephant in the room. We're going to start with your homosexuality. We're going to start with this. That's how we're going to start this da'wah with homosexuality. With homosexuals. That's how I start with them. I don't start with tawhid. This is the only group because the Quran kind of taught me this. And if we can, because this will be too big an objection for them. It's too big. We have to deal with it first. And we will ask them the following. How can you prove your position? The Quran in no less than three different places asks a rhetorical question or asks a normal question, which is قُلْ هَاتُوا بُرْهَانَكُمْ إِنْ كُنْتُمْ صَادِقِينَ well, It's actually a proposition. Bring your evidences if you are truthful. What is the argument of the homosexual? The argument of the homosexual is that we're not doing anything wrong because you can do whatever you like really so long as you're not harming anybody else. This comes from a liberal ethic. You can do whatever you like so long as you're not harming anyone else. It's called the harm principle. This is what they say. So we, are, we ask them, I mean, is this really the case? Because last time I saw it was LGBTQ. I didn't find it LGBTQI for incest. Because incest, you can do, why not? A brother and another brother 
Our two gay brothers. How about that? I'm not even going to say sister. So you, do you discriminate against those gays? What can they say about this? Why haven't you included those? I've asked many of them that question. Some of them said, you know what, you have a point. I was like... <laughs> <laughs> but the injustice has already been done. The injustice has already been... According to you... I asked another one, do you know what he said to me? He said, it's not natural. I said, really? You're telling me? <laughs> <laughs> I said, you're going to use an argument that is natural or not natural? He says, what's your evidence against? I said, why am I going to tell you the evidence against? You're the one saying it's okay. You're the one telling me that you can do whatever you want so long as you don't harm anyone else. Isn't that a statement of truth? Aren't you making a, a truth statement here? Okay, tell me why that's true, that you can do whatever you want so long as you don't harm anyone else. Oh, we this and that, and we don't have evidence. And John Stuart Mill had an entire book who was the father of social liberalism, he had a whole book trying to prove what you call the harm principle and he failed miserably. He says you hear things because you hear them. You see things because you see them and you desire things because you desire them. It's a circular argument. It had no veracity whatsoever. It was humiliating. Even other philosophers rejected it. But for the sake of argument, let's go with it. Okay, fine, let's, for the sake of argument. Is it really true that you're not harming anyone else? Because last time I checked, a homosexual person was anything between 10 to 20 times more likely to carry sexually transmitted diseases. And sexually transmitted diseases can be spread in more than one way. Not just sex. It can be done through blood or saliva or this or that. I'm not talking just about AIDS. Although even that is 10 to 20 times more. So you're affecting everyone by doing this actually. You're spreading diseases, you are effectively spreading, you're exacerbating the spread of sexually transmitted diseases. Someone will say, you know, in the Quran it states, فَأَمْطَرْنَا عَلَيْهِمْ مَطَرًا That particular Sodom and Gomorrah or whatever you want to call them, in the, the, the people of Lut in the Quran, قوم Lut, that there was a punishment afflicted upon them and it wasn't just homosexuality. It was إِنَّكُمْ لَتَأْتُونَ الرِّجَالِ وَتَقَطَعُونَ السَّبِيلِ وَتَأْتُونَ فِي نَادِيكُمُ الْمُنْكَرِ There was more than one reason. It's mentioned in Surah Al-A'ankabut. That you are cutting the roads, you are doing homosexual act actions, and you are doing munkar, evil actions. So there was a collection of actions. Of course, they didn't even believe in Allah. But where is the matar from hijara on all these things? Well, the Prophet told us, actually. He said, in the future... People will be committing sexually lewd actions and we will invent for them new diseases that were never affected before. Yani, if you really consider it, I would rather, many people would rather die instantly through rocks coming from the sky than a slow disease which degenerates you over a span of time. It's a slow and painful death. And you look at your private parts and the genetical warts. And blood is coming out of your rectum, sorry to say. And I don't know what's coming out of your mouth and this and that. This is a slow and painful reality. Is this not a punishment? Could this not be a punishment? Of course it could be from the Islamic perspective. Of course it could be. وَبَلَوْنَاهُمْ بِالْحَسَنَاتِ وَالسَّيِّئَاتِ لَعَلَّهُمْ يَرْجَعُونَ and we have tried them with good things and bad things. Maybe they'll come back. Maybe they'll come back. The point I'm making is even if we go with the harm principle that you can do whatever you want so long as you don't harm anyone else. There is no guarantee that you're not going to harm anyone else. In fact, there's more of a chance on probability that you will harm somebody else. But is that the only harm? We know there are other forms of harm. We know that families with two partners, with almost all the studies that have done on this, families with two partners are more likely to, 
the, the children in that family are more likely to what? To be delinquent. To have a lower educational attainment. They are more likely to be criminal. They are more likely to have psychological pathology. Do you know what's really interesting? When you have two women and they are the two so-called mothers, somehow, I don't know how, but let's just say, they are the two so-called mothers and they're in a relationship. Domestic violence, according to their statistics, is highest or very, very high in this category of lesbianism. Why? Because there's, the power balance has been disturbed. I mean, I'm sure many of you, put your hands up if you're married. There's many married people. I'm married as well. And I've had my disagreements with my wife in my time. I've been married for 11 years. But I don't recall the last time my wife, out of anger and frustration, challenged me to a fight. Not only that, hopefully the men in this audience have the same experience. Because it's a disadvantage. Even the UFC would not allow such a thing. Why? Because there's a power, there's weight categories. There's size, bone, this, that, testosterone. This is not fair. She might call her parents. She might go to her friends. She might give me the stone walling me and giving me the cold shoulder. But last time I found that she was actually trying to assault me was never. <laughs> but you know, what's interesting about that is that the LGBTQ situation is connected to transgender ideology. And transgender ideology is effectively the following. It is effectively what psychologists refer to as psychosis. This is it. Because psychosis is, is officially when you lose touch with reality. This is an official definition. There was a time those people in my family that went to the mental asylum. I don't know what you call it here. The, you know, the mental hospital, basically for the insane or, or for people who are mentally challenged. I don't know what you guys call it here. Is this correct? Is this politically correct? I'm not sure, yeah? Even if it is, I don't care. You know, I'm, I'm only joking. <laughs> anyway, I remember very cl clearly person came out in the morning and he said, and he was walking like Arnold Schwarzenegger. <laughs> Put his head up. He goes, I am half man, half robot. And then the three Nigerians, big ones, they came, grabbed him and they put, they put some me medicines in him. I don't know what it was. They tried to sedate him. But in the mental hospital, you put the medicine in him, but in the university, you give him a prize. <laughs> and you attack those who go against him. I don't understand it. I think that there's going to be a time in history. Just like now, the Western white man. He looks at the ancient Greeks. He looks at Athens. Athena, Zeus, Hercules. He says, look at these people. They used to believe in Zeus and Hercules and these ones. He says, look at these fictions that they used to believe in. But I am proposing that Hercules is more real than the proposition that an XXY a chromosome is XY. Because at least in the, in the case of the former, you cannot really falsify the existence of Hercules. Because it's not empirically. You cannot put Hercules under a microscope. He's a fake, fake figure. But you can easily falsify the idea that X, X is XY and XY is X. Hundred years from now, the whites will be making fun of these whites here with this transgender ideology. They're gonna, Barry and John are going to have a discussion. He's going to say, you know, hundred years ago, these guys used to say that, you know, the XX used to say the XY and the male used to say the female. I mean, look at these stupid people. What kind of myth did they believe in? The anti-science community. <laughs> That's what they're talking about. Anti-science community. And the truth of the matter is, if you push this forward, think of what the implications of this is. This has serious implications. If you're saying biological, 
that biology doesn't matter effectively. Like you can invent your own, you know, you can invent your own pronoun or you can say whatever you like. Then, in, let's say in a South African context, 29 years ago there was apartheid, yes? It's unbelievable really, 29 years ago in, the, in effectively a country that is influenced by the West, you know, there's apartheid. Shocking, you know, racism and all this. But according to the transgender ideology, just like sex is a social construct, so too then must be race a social construct. Then if race is a social construct, guess what? So is racism. So you can see how this can lead to a new racism. You'll see a black guy, or let's say a white guy, say he's black. So a white guy say I'm black. There's no racism. I'm black myself. I identify as black. And he was the one who he was, he was doing the punishment. His father was part of the government or something, and he was doing it. He said, no, I identify as black. Are you going against my identification? And so you see, racism can be eliminated. I was one time in an elevator. I was doing gender studies on a postgraduate level in one of the universities in London, left-wing university. And the woman, just out of nowhere, she said, you know, she said, uh, you know, the penis is a social construct. <laughs> now, I had lots of, I just wanted to have a one-liner. I know Mohammed Khan likes one-liners. Where is he? I wanted to have a one-liner because, you know, the elevator is going to go quickly. What I did say was the following. I said, if you say the penis is a social construct, then guess what? So is rape. Because isn't rape a penetrative act with a penis into the vagina? And she just stood there. <laughs> I said, by the way, I don't believe rape is a social construct. And I left. Just to make sure that she understood the point. If you want to eliminate the science from the scientific, from this discourse, from the male. And do you know, the whole transgender ideology is, is defeated in one line of the Quran. The male is not the same as the female. Can you imagine? One, it's not, it's not even an area. It's, it doesn't deserve too much recognition. The male is not the same as the female. Let's, let's move on. Because it's self-evident. So self-evident to those Nigerians that put the chemicals into that person in the mental hospital. So self-evident to all these civilizations which existed for hundreds of thousands of years. So self-evident to doctors who have to perform surgeries on the basis of, of the different you know, res uh, reproductive things in both men and women. It's self-evident. So transgender ideology is not a threat. It's a threat only onto themselves. I mean, consider the following point. If I said to you, look, I'm 50 years old. Now, I know most of you believe this. I'm not 50 years old. <laughs> But is there any way of you disproving this statement? I mean, can you cut my belly from this and see like a tree how many circles are inside me? What is the proof of how old I am? It's testimonial evidence. Only I tell you and then you have to believe it. There was no one there with any of you for each second of your life with a camera that's going to put it on YouTube every second of your life. A 31 year long video. It doesn't exist. But if you're allowing genders to identify in whatever way they like, then surely you should allow people to identify with whatever age they like. But you can see the problem already. The problem is then I identify as a child. Why can't I go into a primary school and sit down and say I identify as 13 or 12 or 10 or whatever? I mean, it says age discrimination. No, but you really have to justify to me, if you're allowing this, if you're allowing gender to be identified in whatever way you like, then why can't I just say and mean it full well that age is just a number? And it's a socially constructed number. Because quite frankly, there's more evidence of my gender than there is of my age. Take my blood and see the X's and the Y's. 
But you can find out x, y, but you can't find out how old I am through my blood. You can do an estimation. So if there's more science on the, on the, on, on the side of my gender than the, or the, my sex than there is on my age, and yet you allow one and not the other, this is where the slippery slope. This is the slippery slope. <laughs> And so transgender ideology leads to real-life pedophilia. Pre -pu when we talk about pedophilia here, we're talking about prepubescence. Um, a, pr a pubescent can actually identify as a prepubescent. Should be. Why not? And a prepubescent can identify as a pubescent. Why not? We're not talking just about ages. Why not? A black man can identify as a white and a white can identify as a black. Therefore, racism is gone. There is no racism because race is a social construct. To defeat the transgender ideology, it is not by using, it is not necessarily by using facts. It's by showing the logical absurdities that come about by the, the implications, the practical implications of believing what they believe and how it's an affront to what they believe elsewhere through liberalism and human rights. It is an affront to their own version of human rights. Not just to our religion. Which leaves us with feminism. We, we leave the least for last. <laughs> so they say last but not least. But I say least and least. Least and last. Which is feminism. And the Quran deals with feminism just like it deals with liberalism. In so much as the Quran says about liberalism, not obviously the official ideology, but its assumption, which is referred to as the hedonistic principle. Have you seen the one who has taken his own desires as God? The hedonistic principle is effectively you do whatever you, gives you pleasure. And then of course they put the harm principle there so long as you don't harm anyone else. These two things are liberalism, social liberalism. Hedonistic principle, harm principle. And if you want to add one more thing, the utilitarian principle, as many good for as many people. That's it. So we're trying to maximize the pleasure of as many people as possible. That's basically what liberalism is. And without harm. That's it. Hedonistic principle. The Quran asks you the question, have you seen the one who has taken his own desires as, as God? So can you see, subhanAllah, the, the Qur'an is de dealing with each and every single one of these ideologies, or at least assumptions of each and every single one of them. The Qur'an deals with liberalism before I get to feminism in other, one other way, which I thought about and I done tadabbar of, and it's very interesting. The following. Allah has created the universe, right? He's created the universe with an incredible itqan, precision. Now someone will say how. Say, look, the universe is finely tuned in some way. You don't want to believe that? Fine. It's regular. It's stable. It is uniform and it allows life to exist. You cannot, you cannot deny this. Allah says, وَلَوْ تَبَعَ الْحَقَّ أَهْوَاءَهُمْ لَفَسَدَتِ السَّمَوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضُ وَمَنْ فِيهِنْ In Surah Al-Mu'minun, chapter 23. That if the truth had followed their desires, everything in the universe had been, would have been destroyed. Meaning what? Meaning the truth must be based on consistent measures. The truth must be based on consistent measures. For example, this building that we are in right now, the architect that engineered or drew the, the initial plans for this building had to use mathematics. You cannot be an architect without being good at maths. You cannot be an engineer without being good at mathematics. Or at least know it. And many engineers are in this room and they know what I'm talking about. So you have to have precise, symmetrical, this and that, whatever, calculations. If it's not in place, then what would happen is that this ceiling would be destroyed, destroy us all, would be crumbled underneath it. Like a house of cards, it would just fall, fall down. Like a house of cards. Or like dominoes. Allah is telling us the universe is done with precision. You can see it, you're living in it. Do you see any gaps in it? He's asking us questions. Allah is asking us. And then he said that if the universe had been, or if the truth had been connected to their desires, which is volatile, one day they're happy, one day they're sad, one day they're angry, one day they're this, one day they're that, 
the whole universe would have been destroyed. Meaning what? Liberalism itself, it's a volatile measure and it doesn't have any truth value inside of it. The idea of the hedonistic principle, following your own desires, is uncertain and inconsistent. And had the universe been based on that, no one would be alive. It's a very interesting argument. It's showing you the importance of truth to a people who don't care about it. Like we just shown with the LGBT thing, with Lut, they didn't care. They said, "Akhrijuhum min qariyatikum," bring them out. They didn't want to debate with him. They didn't care about the truth. We're saying there's a bigger elephant in the room. The elephant is you don't care about truth. But had you not cared about truth, and the universe had been based on falsehood, if the universe or the proportions and the constituents and the dimensions of the universe been based on a false, inconsistent and volatile measure, the universe itself would have imploded upon itself. And are you not benefiting from the universe? Are you not breathing the air of the universe? Are you not drinking the water from the universe? Are you not pleasuring yourselves in this universe? So you benefit from a consistent truth. But you ditch it when it comes to morality. This is a double standard. Very interesting. Very interesting. It shows you the importance of truth. And it shows you the psychology of a people who don't care about it. Can you see how deep the Quran is doing muhalaja, diagnosis of these issues of the current day? If you just think of it with care. If you just think about the Quran with care, how it just completely diagnoses what's going on. These people don't care about truth. And this is the implication of them not carrying out truth. Had the universe proportions been based on their falsehood, then the universe would have been closed. That's why Allah says in the Quran, to Al Amran, Ma khalaqat hadha batila. You haven't created this universe, heavens and the earth, in falsehood. He created it in truth. Had he created it in falsehood, we wouldn't be able to observe it. They don't care about truth. And with feminism, there's something deeper. And it's very interesting because with these things, we, we find two things out. How pragmatically the ideologies don't work. How epistemologically they don't contain any truth. And how psychologically these people think, or people with these ideologies think. In the case of feminism, it's perfectly captured. In Surah Al-Nisa. وَلَا تَتَمَنَّوا Allah says this, very beautiful, very amazing. Think about it with care. Because people, men and women, sometimes they, we're all comparative creatures, we all compare. Social creatures compare. Allah is saying, وَلَا تَتَمَنَّوا مَا فَضَّلَ اللَّهُ بِهِ بَعْضُكُمْ عَلَى بَعْضُ لِلْرِّجَالِ نَصِيبٌ مِمَّا اكْتَسَبُوا this is so amazing and beautiful. It captures the whole feminist psyche. And it's interesting because the verses before it was talking about inheritance. But it says general verses and it's giving general advice. As the scholars say, This is generic verses. And there are generic al-fad, which means phrases, which says the following. Do not wish what the other one has. To a man is a portion of what he has earned. And for a woman is a portion of what she has earned. And ask Allah from his bounty. The fact of the matter is, feminism couldn't exist if resentment and embitterment and blaming others didn't exist. Deflection. Feminism is perfect for an, a, a resentful person. That wants to blame another person for why things are going wrong in their life. You want to blame other people? Say, I wish I, why, do, why does he get to have this and not me? Why does he get to have a career and I'm staying home with the kids? Why does he get to say the final word and I'm the one who has to follow what he has to say? Why does the brother have double what the sister has an inheritance? 
Why can the man just say Talaq, one word, and the whole relationship ceases? And the woman has to go through a formal procedure if she wants to do it from herself. Why does the man, why can the man marry four wives and the woman cannot marry four husbands? Why isn't it just one and one? Why, why, why? And you see how many times they ask why? As if we are the interrogated and they are the interrogator. As if we are the defendant and they are the judge. They're not our judge. They're not fit to be our judge. Because the same basic question before we ask why, why, why is one. How can you prove that despite physical, psychological, anatomical, physiological, and psychological differences between men and women that everything should be the same. Isn't this the assumption of feminism? Let me tell you something. You have bus drivers here, right? Bus drivers. Have you heard of a blind bus driver? If I'm a blind man and I apply for a job as a bus driver and they say no, could I say this is disability discrimination? No. Because they will say, listen, being a bus driver entails that you can see the road. There's a difference between someone who can see and someone who not see. There's an advantage on the side of someone who can see, and this affects the majority of people. Therefore, we're going to suspend your individual right for the collective right. Simple as that. We don't even, we don't even entertain anything else. We wouldn't even consider it. But then when the feminist in America she wants to have an equal number of firefighters in the fire, in the fire brigade in America, in New York. And this is true news. They want to have equal number. So in order to have equal number, you have a person who is slower, that they don't meet the obstacle course requirements, weaker, less brave, and so on. So that people in burning buildings now have to have a second rate treatment in the name of gender equality? Is it not the same as putting a blind man in a bus? It may not be as extreme, I agree. It might not be as severe, but yet we can make a case that difference here has caused an effect, a consequence which affects the majority of people. And they're doing it to their own demise. Before they had, for example, in the United Kingdom, it was illegal for a woman to fight in the front line. Illegal, by law. Now they've allowed it. You know, this is for many people in the world who have been oppressed by the British and American armies. Good news, actually. <laughs> I was telling one of my friends, I was speaking to some people, and one of the guys were Iraqi. Okay, from Iraq. And I was explaining these things and I saw a smirk on his face and I realized why he's smirking. Because the truth of the matter is this, consider the following. The combination of feminism, transgender ideology and liberalism, it's actually destroying the military capabilities of the Western world. China and Russia and Iran or whatever other country are unlikely to defeat the Western empires. The most people the most likely candidate for the destruction of the Western civilization is the Western civilization itself. Consider the following. If you are told you have a fight tomorrow, okay? Sorry to say, you're going to have to fight in the courtyard. It's a one-on-one -on -one fight. You're going to get nervous. Everyone's going to get, I would get nervous as well. I know it's hard to believe. I would, everyone would get nervous. <laughs> even Mike Tyson used to get nervous. I don't want to say even, you know. Anyway. Anyone would get nervous, but then if I called you up and I said, listen, I have some news about your opponent. He has decided to, to remove his genitalia. <laughs> he has done SRS. <laughs> he has done SRS surgery. He has done SRS surgery. He removed his genitalia. What would that do? Would that fill you up with confidence or fear? Surely it would fill you up with confidence. 
He's removed his genitalia. He has less testosterone. He's probably in pain. His, his muscle density has probably gone down dramatically. In fact, his bravery will be affected because testosterone affects bravery. Every single field, he's making himself weaker. I'm not sure if you've ever seen the difference between the Russian army. There's, a, there's an advert online, <laughs> okay, which compares the American army with the Russian army. And the American army military uh, advertisement starts with a lesbian person. Honestly, the rainbow flag and I was always this and inclusivity and all that. And then they, they juxtaposed it with the Russian. Men shooting this and that from the... Anyone Russian will be looking at this and saying, we've got it, we're going we're gonna to finish them. <laughs> They're doing wrestling and this and that and fighting the bears and all these kind of things. And this one's like cutting their own thing. And this one's become a woman come, <laughs> come in the army. I can do it if you can do it. Unbelievable. So it's a double-edged sword, actually. The LBG, actually, the LGBT uh, thing is good in a way because it's destroying the armies of the colonizer. It's weakening them. So long as we're not affected, you know, they say, Robert Greene, so many people have said this, in fact, even Sun Tzu, do not disturb your enemy when he's making a mistake. Look, if, I, if there was no Muslim communities in the West, if the West didn't have the hegemony, I would just say, shut your mouth, just leave them, leave them. Please. I might even wear rainbow flags. <laughs> I'm only kidding, I wouldn't do this. I would never do this. Subhanallah. But do you know what I mean? You leave them. The colonizer wants to cut the genitalia and put the women on the front lines and put the, the compose the police forces. I saw a video on Twitter the other day of a woman trying to stop a man criminal and he was a drunkard. I'm not sure if you've seen this. And it was in the UK. And she couldn't do it. And he was weak and flimsy and drunk. Like if someone just done that, he would have fallen on the floor. And she was trying her best and whatever. And this is not the place for you, sorry to say. This is not the place for you. I was walking in my area in West London in England and I saw a female officer and she actually tried to stop me and speak to me. I said to her, listen, you on a 38,000 pound salary, yeah, Sterling, I know and you know you wouldn't risk your life for what they're doing in there. If a man brought out a Rambo knife and tried to stab another man, would you actually risk your life? She looked at me and she knew and I knew what the answer to that question was. They're destroying, it's inefficient. But of course, they're going to have a response. So let me tell you what the response is. The response is the following. They say, listen, how can you remove half of the workforce from an economy? That's the response. They're going to say, we have women working. That increases our taxes. We are able to take money from these. And, and so it's efficient from an economic perspective. That's why you're finding they'll attribute it. They may even attribute it to the fact that women have been given so-called liberation. The answer to that question is as follows. Tell me the amount of problems that you would get when you don't have nuclear families. It is clear from the data that when you have single parent households, or when you have households where the mother is not present in the house. Well Farron wrote a nice book called The Boy Crisis about, and he mentions lots of things about this, for example. But there are lots of things. I've had lots of interviews with demographers and others on this on my channel. You can find it in your own time. But the point is this. It's clear from the data that when you don't have a nuclear family, you have less educational attainment, you have more delinquency, you have more criminality. So, okay, put the women in the workforce. But now the state is going to have to pay for all of the crime. Now the state is going to have to pay, especially if it's paying already for the medical bills, for the medical bills of the delinquent ones. Now the state is going to have to pay for the psychological traumas that these people are going through and the pathologies which are known by the data is happening. So don't tell me, okay, well, this is going to save us money. It may save you money in the first 10 years, but it will lose you money in the, in the next 20 or 30. And that's what we have seen definitely by the longitudinal data. One of the most important studies that have been done to this effect is Blanche Flower and Oswald that was done between 1960 to, to 1990. 
And it was the longest, longitudinal study that was done of 100,000 women in England and in America. And it was shown conclusively that their mental health degenerated after the passing of equal legislation stuff in America. The legislation, the feminist movement. So it's harmed women as well. So even if you want to argue there'll be a net income, is the harm that the women in your countries are suffering such that 85% of them, according to Satra magazine, which is a French one magazine, by the way, said that they would, or 83% said they would leave their jobs if they had the chance straight away. They would leave it. In the West, that's what they're saying, they would leave it. In the East and other places, they would say, I want to I go and work. But the Western woman wants to leave, but the, the other one, she wants to copy. Two different mentalities completely. Is the, is the money worth that depression for the woman? I thought you cared about women. But how is it the case then that all the data shows, and it's called the happy paradox, that women are actually degenerating psychologically because of your policies? You see, when you manipulate the social order of things, the way that Allah and the Messenger has showed us in the Quran, then this is what you get, dysfunctionality. Dysfunctionality. <laughs> now, it's 8.10. I do want to leave some time for questions and answers because we've got another kind of 45 minutes to 50 minutes to speak and engage you guys. So with that, I will conclude. Wassalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. It is true that it is indeed true that Muslims in our communities are promoting and propagating this LGBTQ plus agenda. On that premise, I have, I have two questions, inshallah. Number one, would naming and discussing these individuals as a protective measure be considered as a ghibah? Number two, if these individuals are family members and after you've attempted to give them da'wah, it was unsuccessful, would keeping your children away from these dangerous ideals or uh, family members, would that be considered as the breaking of family ties? This is two questions which have a lot of fiqh implications, but I will tell you some things. In regards to the first thing, if someone says something publicly, okay, and they are speaking on behalf of the religion, it's not Hiba and Namimba to correct this publicly. Because if they are misguiding the community, if someone says, well, alcohol in any quantity, just to be clear, in any, in any quantity is halal. Alcohol in any quantity, not just, you know, some opinions or whatever. I'm saying in any quantity. Then someone says, no one said that from the scholars. This, this guy is, off the, you know, he's, he's outrageous. This is not riba and namima. This is correcting something which has been said, which deviates the public. That's the first thing. In terms of, I'll tell you something that many people didn't know. The transgender issue has actually been dealt with in a way in the hadith. There was a person, I don't know, it's a khuntha, whether the person had a penis or not, okay? But it's a person in Bukhari is mentioned that he's the person with like four, I don't know, it's rolls or... Oh, sorry. It's a person with like four rolls or six rolls or something like that when he goes forward and six when he goes backwards. Yes, it's a, discuss a discussion. Now, is this person removed their penis, sorry to say, Yanni, or is the person not removed their penis? We don't know, but they were definitely effeminate. And this person, the Prophet ﷺ, actually told his wives, yeah, don't let this person come into your house ever. And I actually started doing some research and found another hadith of how the Prophet ﷺ dealt with that particular individual because he was starting to affect the community. And he left him, according to one narration, to al baqiya So he, he separated. He did. He separated his family from them. When the da'wah wasn't working with them. I mean, imagine they had the Prophet ﷺ there, and they were not interested. I'm not saying that they were disbelievers, that person, by the way. They were just effem extremely effeminate. Maybe they had removed. We don't, I don't know if they had removed it or not. I tried to look at the shuruhat and stuff of Nawi and Ibn Hajar, but we can discuss if they had removed or not. We don't know for sure. Well, at least I don't know for sure. But for sure, I know that there was a policy of separation. Now, is it seen as a breaking of family ties? Now, this is a fiqhi question which you would have to refer to your local ulama. Is it 
if, it's, if the person, let's define what Qat al Rahim is first. Qat al Rahim is when somebody is blood related. By the way, it's not necessarily somebody who is in your family and not blood related. For example, the in laws. Now, I'm not saying therefore, <laughs> some guys are going to say, oh, really? <laughs> No, yani, I'm not saying therefore, you know, you should leave the in-laws or this. I'm not saying this, just, just to be clear. But I'm saying qat rahim as a concept. Rahim literally means from the same blood. It's not, it wouldn't be considered qat rahim Cutting the family ties in that formal sense. It might be considered something else. And it would not be good if you, if you cut the ties with the in-laws or this or that. Unless, of course, there's always exceptions. Imagine if some in-law tried to kill you. I mean, some of you may have experienced this, I don't know, in South Africa, you have guns. <laughs> One day you're having an argument with your wife and you just see a bullet coming through it. What's going on? And you see the in-law outside or something. I don't know if that happened. You had riots in 2020. I don't know. They, in the guise of the riots, they, they, were, they were shooting friendly fire or something. I don't know. <laughs> or maybe it's the son-in-law trying to do it to the father-in-law. Say, I'll go out with you today in the riots. And then you're, you're out behind them and you start shooting. And the, and the father-in-law is there. I don't know if this happened. But the point is, notwithstanding all these points, that's something you're going to have to refer to your local ulama for a precise fatwa. But just on two issues, yes, there is a hadith from the Prophet on this issue about people that were acting in an effeminate manner. And there's also a discussion about what is a rahim that is referred to in the Quran, al and it doesn't include anything other than really, if you look at all the tafsir of this, it doesn't really include your in-laws, this is ashira, or other words are used, but it's not really ar-rahim. But as for whether you can cut or not, this you need to present your exact situation to a scholar in your community, and you say to him, this is my situation. I've tried with him this many times, this is his situation. This is a hukum that is really to be passed on this person. Uh, so these are some questions from the women section. Number one here, it's, it's, it's from one person, but it's two questions. Please talk about Aisha radiallahu anha, uh, her age difference with the Prophet, especially how do we explain it to a non-Muslim. And number two, there was still slavery in Islam. We know the Prophet ﷺ was most kind, but some people aren't, especially to women slaves. Why did the Prophet ﷺ not just abolish it? So how do we explain the age of Aisha radiallahu anha to a, non, to a non-Muslim? and slavery, why did Nabi Sallallahu just abolish it? Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. So the age of Aisha radiallahu anha. You know, when they make claims about the Prophet Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, you should just say, so what? What's wrong with it? What's the matter with you? You can't just sit there and just absorb all of the attacks, the arrows, as if we are now being in a court case and they're the judge during executioner with all due respect and the issue for them for the age of Aisha radiallahu anha is one a misunderstanding of Islamic legal or moral theory or reasoning and it's also because of contemporary western culture and the way to deal with this is in the following way you basically essentially, and you basically, well, one thing is a lot of people cite history, which is a good additional argument, but it's not the core argument. And I don't like using it necessarily, because a lot of liberals or the people that we were talking to would basically say, oh, but times have changed, we're progressive, we disagree with that now. And it's not good to use that as a core argument, but it's good as a supporting argument. But nevertheless, just say to them a few things. When it comes to age of concern, or when it comes to the marriageable age and so on and so forth, we have a very robust moral and legal theory or reasoning. And we say the following. The first thing we have to understand is the usuli principle of there is no harming and no reciprocating of harm. This is a well-known principle in moral and legal reasoning in the Islamic tradition. So we would argue that there can't be any psychological and physical harm. The second moral and legal principle is urf, meaning social custom is determinative in fiqh. Is this clear? So think about these two moral principles or legal principles. Number one, 
there is no harming and no reciprocating of, reciprocating of harm. And number two, urf is determinative in fiqh. So, let's apply that situation to Aisha radiallahu anha. Based on those principles and based on the life of Aisha radiallahu anha, we know that there was no physical or psychological harm. The age is irrelevant. We're applying the principles here. We also know from an Urfi perspective, her father, Abu Bakr radiallahu an said, take her. The society itself didn't even disagree with what was going on. So it was based on social custom as well. So what's the problem? These are timeless moral legal principles. Maybe if you apply them in an orthodox Islamic context in today's society, we will basically say it will be blameworthy to marry a nine-year-old because the urf has changed, especially in Western cultures. And it may be argued because of social and biological aspects and the development of the human being because the human being is not just biologically, it's not dicta dictated by the essential biological features, but there's also a form of socialization. It could be the case because of our environments that there may be harm. We stand in that possibility. But if you understand the moral legal reasoning of Islam and you apply it in that time and in this time, you're always going to get the right answer. But if you apply the secular principles in New York, I believe, if you have the permission of your parents, you could uh, get married at the age of 14. In some countries, it's 12. Other countries, 21. Other countries, 18. You're inconsistent. I could technically get married in New York with the permission of the parents, I think, if she's 14 or 12 or whatever the case may be. And then if I go to another state in America, I go to Europe, I become a pedophile. Inconsistent, incoherent. And it's simple as that. We have low, moral legal principles. And we say when you apply them, you get the right answer. And at the time of the Prophet Sallam, and maybe other times too, there's no, if there's no physical or psychological harm, and the, 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 urf, the urf is basically facilitating this, and the way to assess that is obviously dealt with, with our fuqaha and our ulama. We're not going to discuss that right now. But if, the, if it's in line with the urf, then what's the problem? I remember the first time I took my wife to Hyde Park. It was the only time. <laughs> you should never take your wife to Hyde Park. Alhamdulillah, you know, she was wearing the qab, she was with me, no one was, you know, messing around. They would have got in big trouble. This was, I think, before Muhammad Hijab overtook the scene. MashaAllah, tabarakallah, may Allah preserve him. Say, Ameen. May Allah grant him and his family the best in this life and the best in life to come. Say, Ameen. So, we were discussing something in the car, and then some white guy, you know, Dirty liberal. You know he didn't cut his nails, brush his teeth. You know he didn't wash his bum. One of those guys. You, at the end of the day, sometimes you have to psychologicalize it. How can you take seriously the philosophy of someone who doesn't wash his backside? He's got crusty bum. <laughs> hey, Mr. Crusty Bum, why should I take you seriously? We need to civilize you. <laughs> Let's be honest here. Come on. Come on. Hey, so he says to her, Ah, oh, your prophet married a nine-year-old, this, that, and the other. And she just turned back and said, so what age did you want her to be? His mouth was on the floor. His mouth was on the floor. He didn't know what to say because he knew any age that he gave would have been arbitrary and it would have got him into a legal and moral mess. Islam, generally speaking, especially the Sharia, is not based on arbitrary numbers. There are some instances, but generally speaking, it's very principle-based. That's why it's timeless. You see these principles, there is no harm and no reciprocating of harm. And we have our own definitions and application of that, of course. And there is no, and, and urf is determinative in fiqh. The social custom in certain contexts is determinative in fiqh. When you apply that time, place, you're always going to get the right answer. No one's going to be harmed and everything's going to be fine. So in a London context, for example, if someone were to say to me, would you allow a 60-year-old or 50-year-old marry your 9-year-old daughter? i say, no, it's immoral. Because of the Islamic principles, 
because of, of urf, of the social custom, because of maybe of harm as well in our particular context, because of certain environmental factors that slow down the developmental process of certain, certain issues. So it's not the age itself that's arbitrary. We apply moral principles and we're proud of them. And it served us one, it served humanity well. They have the problem. But anyway, if you link this to the LGBTQ plus ideology, Gail Rubin, who wrote the essay that I mentioned in 1984, she, in the first four paragraphs, she's, she's, she's justifying basically pedophilia. They are blurring the lines of consent. Someone hasn't reached puberty and they are actually mutilating them and giving them the puberty blockers. So on what moral ground do you have to say about this issue? With all due respect, be consistent. And this is enshrined in your law, in your so-called rights. You're mutilating children or young people and you're giving them medicines that's actually harming them. Do you see the point here? And they're blurring the lines of consent to the degree you have thinkers today and thinkers yesterday, Gil Rubin and others, that are now saying that having sex with minors is not a problem. They actually call this a form of discrimination. Because remember gender theory? Queer theory, rather, based on the postmodern principles? We don't like categories. It includes age. We include the kind of distinction between adult and child. That's a category based on a social construct. We want to disturb that. So it's okay for men to sleep with young boys, just like their, their prophet, Foucault, who raped Algerian boys in a graveyard. And you think you have the audacity to point the finger at us? you got three fingers pointing back. Do you see? I think that's a good answer, but if, also if you go to history, it's kind of self-defeated. You know, many of these people came from uh, uh, marriages that were young. You know, many widows were the age of 18. Some of them married at the age of 9, 10, 11, and 12. And actually in law, it was allowed in Scotland, I believe in the 1800s or late 1800s, to marry a 7-year-old, I believe. And some of these things happened. And they are the basically children of these people. It's a bit self-defeating to deny it, if you, do you know what I mean? But that's a historical point. So hopefully that addresses the questions. Zakhri Allah knows best. Um, there's, oh, there was a second question about slavery. I don't know if we should address that. Should we, should we address that as well? Or? Okay. Just, um, <clears throat> just to add to this point, you can always ask the question, okay, you're saying it's wrong for him to marry a nine-year-old, no problem. Is this consequentially wrong or is it categorically wrong? Because remember, all of ethics is divided into two for them, right? If you look at a ethics is right and wrong, morality. What is right and wrong? If you look at any kind of book on ethics and morality, you'll see that it's either consequentialist morality or categorical morality. This, these are the only distinctions that they have which are prescriptive. Virtue ethics is not prescriptive. A consequential thing is to say, yes, it's consequentially wrong because it's harmful. In which case we say, can you prove that it's harmful? Because there was no reports to show that Aisha was harmed. In fact, all of the reports show the opposite, that she was enjoying it and that she was jealous. So many reports show that she was jealous. How can you be jealous unless you're in love? And how can you be in love if you're being harmed like this? There's so many reports to show how jealous that she was and how in love that she was and all this kind of thing. There was no reports of I was being harmed and I was, you try and find that. There's even a report that says that she went through puberty, by the way, when she married the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. There is a report like this. <laughs> so this is number one. If you say it's categorically wrong, first of all, how do you prove something called the categorical imperative? And why is it categorically wrong? So they, the, the onus is on them or the burden of proof is upon them. Moreover, I was doing some research on the issue and the question is, why did they change the age of consent? And if you look when they changed the age of consent, it really happened in the 20th century. So you'll find, for example, in 1929, there was the Marriage Act in the United Kingdom. Before that, by the way, India constituted a change in the age of consent before England did, by the way. England did it as well in 1929. And it changed from 12 years old. You can get married at 12 in 1929, which is less than 100 years ago, to 16. And this coincided with a time where World War I had just been done. And the liberal government at the time, they instituted educative changes. They connected the time when you finish education 
with when you become an adult. But before, in all of human civilization, the time of when you finish education was not connected with that. So you can see why they think 16 is a more reasonable number. Because they connected it with the education system which they created themselves. So it's arbitrary, but it's also intentional. So why should we be subject to this as a form of morality? Number two, I was thinking about this when sometimes you know, we go and visit like care homes for elderly people. I don't know what they call them here in South Africa. In England, so many of them because people don't take care of their parents effectively. In England, they just leave them in care homes. I mean, a lot of people don't take care of their parents. Not all of them, of course. A lot of people don't take care of their parents. So I went to a care home one time and I was looking around. And, you know, my dour mind was working a little bit. I was thinking, I wonder, because they were all like really senile, like incapable of moving, move a little bit, smile a little bit, do crosswords and these kinds of things. I was thinking, okay, the age of consent in England is 16 years old, but it doesn't have an upper limit. Consider the following. If, I'm not going to say myself, but a man <laughs> decided to engage sexually with one of these elderly women, that's 95 years old. Legally, it's okay. Now, if you... Let me ask you on a medical level. A 15-year-old who's got big hips, big, sorry to say, Yanni, big breasts, this, everything, she's ready, versus a 95-year-old who's withering away and doing crossword, who do you think will be harmed more? The law allows one of them and it doesn't allow the other. Imagine if the man wants to go rough with her. He'll break her collarbones. He'll kill her. He can kill her. Islamically, such a marriage, it would not be allowed because you can hurt the woman. This is what happens when you have arbitrary numbers. So maybe you should ask them, why is it that the age of concern... They may say, and say oh, that's wrong. They should change it. They should have an upper limit. Then where's the upper limit going to be? Because whatever upper limit you choose, there's discrimination going to happen. Because not all 90-year-olds are the same. Not all 80-year-olds are the same. Not all 70-year-olds are the same. No, that's not to say, brothers. <laughs> but I'm saying, like, you know, my dad is 75 years old. Yes, he's been married 10 times. I mean, not all in one time, just in case... But more than 10, I don't know, he keeps getting married, he says, better than Zina. I'm not, I'm not denying the fact. But he goes to a different country, marries younger women. He does. I'll be honest with you. And there's nothing wrong with it. There's nothing wrong with it. I don't want to expose too much, but I'm just saying, these women don't have a problem. So yes. One time he went into a, a, a hospital. Well, lies is no word of a lie. I don't know if I told you. He went to St. Mary's Hospital in England. And he played, you know, the, the red pill, they call it game, or I don't know what they call it, yeah? The guy, I was, he was a young woman, nurse, and he had some papers in his, uh, in his, in his bag. And she, I don't know, maybe she was Christian or something, yeah? Let's just say for the sake of argument. He said, uh, look, I don't want to play games. He goes, I've got a house. And he pulled out some papers, and it wasn't even a deed to a house or anything. He goes, I've got a house here and I'm alone in it, and I want to get married. I said, what do you say? She said, are you being serious? She said, look, I mean, and she was happy to take and change numbers. I was thinking, this guy is playing the game. People are marrying elderly people on a regular basis. There was a supermodel who married an elder man, and then he died the next day. And she took all of his inheritance. I don't know what his name is. is. <laughs> so this elderly marriage thing is very common in the West. Man on woman and woman on man. So why do we always look at this side of the spectrum and not the other side? I mean, at the end of the day, a senile person at a very old age is as vulnerable, you could argue. Imagine if they're on a wheelchair. Yani, I can make the situation worse and worse. The point is this. That's one thing. As for the slavery issue. You know, Islam is the only religion of its age that I know of that has an emancipatory discourse. It actually does. 
what would make you know what the good way is. Freeing slaves is the good way. There is no such verse in the Bible, by the way, like this. Number one. Number two, you'll find in, in the zakat, one of the categories of zakat is wafir riqab, to free the slaves. Yes, it didn't abolish it. I agree with that. Islam didn't abolish slavery. But it put in place a sieve system such that if you did so many sins of dihar, if you took a bad, if you took an oath by accident, for example, if you kill somebody by accident, if you kill a Muslim or a mu'min by accident, then you have to free a slave and many other things that would allow it. Now, in the American experience, in 1861 to 1865, there was a civil war. And most historians say one of the main reasons for that civil war was because of slavery. The Northeast wanted to abolish it with Abraham Lincoln, and the, the South wanted to keep it in place. But if you really consider how many people died in that war, it's more than any other war in American history, even the ones they did with other countries. Which shows you that if you try and abolish something like slavery all of a sudden, look at how many people die. Because if what you want to do is free slaves, and I will not disagree with you, that Islam sees that as a good thing. And there are some, like Al-Qarafi mentions, for example, in his book, of usul that the sharia wants to kind of get rid of it or it's al hurriyah it moves towards hurriyah or freedom it's true but the way in which the sharia does it is very clever and i would propose the following argument it is conceivable in an islamic state for there to be poverty if there's an Islamic state, it is conceivable that there is poverty. But Islam also encourages people to give sadaqah. It puts the impetus on the people to abolish poverty in their own way. Poverty is not a good thing. Islam does not see poverty as a good thing for the recipient, for the person, for the end user. But it doesn't abolish poverty. It's very interesting. Islam does not abolish poverty. It has zakat in place, it has sadaqah. But it is conceivable that even after all zakat is paid, and all, it is conceivable that you can still have people who are impoverished. And if it's not conceivable, then who would you be giving the zakat to in the first place every year? So it's conceivable to have an Islamic state and governance and there to be impoverished and disenfranchised personnel or individuals in that place. Even though Islam from say a cosmological perspective wants to wants poverty to be alleviated but it doesn't abolish poverty because the repercussions of trying to abolish poverty is to strip people away with from certain goods of theirs and to give it to other people which can create further resentments and problems and civil disunities which we have seen in history for example in the soviet union with the communist stuff and stuff we have seen what that leads to like a communist system. We have seen, and we have seen the American... So these two, ex these two experiments have been done. Abolishing slavery has been done, and abolishing poverty has been tried to be done with communism. Both of them failed. Just in as much as Islam attempts to abolish poverty through sadaqah and the impetus of the people, it so does the same with slavery. Not through abolition, but through the impetus and the encouragement through emancipatory discourse of the people. And this is a more wise way of removing something which is socially undesirable for the end user. That's the Islamic stance. As for treating them nicely, then there is a clear hadith, actually many clear hadiths, of the Prophet telling us to free them and or to treat them nicely. There's one hadith that says, Ikhwanukum khawalakum. That your brothers, that you, basically these are your brothers that treat them nicely and feed them from what you eat and clothe them from what you wear and so on. And the other one, Hadith, it states 
that do not, do not call them Sayyid. Sorry, do not call them Rabb. Do not let them call you Lord. And do not call them slave, but call them Fataya. Call them my boy, if you like, or my young one, or whatever, Fataya. <laughs> Fataya literally means boy. Or Fatati. Fatati for the woman, yes? Don't call them Lord, because why? It could interfere, Allahu Alam, it could interfere with the idea of true, the ultimate slavery is to Allah. We believe, لا تعطى لمخلوق في معصية الخالق There is no obedience to the creation and the disobedience to the creator. What is Islam? It's full submission and slavery to Allah. That level of slavery only belongs to Allah. And to reinforce this theological meaning, the Prophet told us, do not call them Lord and do, don't call them, uh, but call them my boy or, or my girl. So call them, yes, there can be a hierarchy in place, but do not call them with words you would call Allah, for example. Is a car that's blocking the way? ND? 570. 570. 266. 266. It's a Daihatsu. It's a Daihatsu. It's urgent. <laughs> okay. So you see, the ultimate, because what is slavery defined as? And this is something important, because we say Islam allows slavery, but we have to be careful here, because what is slavery defined as? In most dictionaries, it's defined as legally owning an individual who would then obey you completely or something like that. Really and truly, Islam allows a kind of indentured servitude. But the word slavery, especially in an English context and in a Western context, has connotations which Islam has nothing to do with. The most important of them is the racial implication. The transatlantic slave trade. The buying and selling of black people. This, Islam has nothing to do with. In fact, there is a book that is called White Gold. And it's about a Moroccan king. His name is Moulay Ismail. He is one of the guys who has the most kids in history. He has, I think, 400 or something. And it's about he took slaves from Europe. And they were whites. And this guy called Giles, I don't know his surname, whatever his name is, who wrote that book, White Gold, he was very upset about this. He's a right-wing conservative in, in England. He's very upset and he's talking about it. And they called him over and they tried to beg him to release the white slaves. And they br brought him to the pleasure palaces. And they tried to tempt him with women, but this is the worst strategy with a man who's got 400 kids <laughs> and so many white slaves. <laughs> and apparently, according to the, uh, according to the uh, narrations, they, they brought women and he didn't even, he didn't even look at Ghadd al-Basar. I mean, to be honest with you, if he didn't, I would question his Islam. <laughs> I would question his Islam. He's got all this. But the point is, this shows you that it wasn't a racial matter in Islam. I mean, with all due respect, I'm not saying this one or that one, but I'm saying, look at the amount of white slaves that were taken by the Muslims. So it's not a matter of the, the colonial justification of the black slaves and stuff. And they had a racial argument which is foreign in the Islamic understanding. Because we say, la fadla, there is no virtue over a black man or a white man, a white man over a black man, clear. Which is why Islam is the most cosmopolitan and multiracial religion in the world. So when we say slavery, we have to remove it from all connotations which have to do with the racial transatlantic slave trade that was perpetuated in the West. And the racial justifications were given in that in that world. Really, the Islamic conception is far removed from such conception altogether. Next question. as alaikum. I just had one question. Actually, I had two, but I need to give my brother a chance as well. Uh, your whole speech and what's going on online and throughout the world, especially the Western world, and it's coming to the East as well, and yeah, so I just wanted to ask your remarks on this ayah of the Quran, uh, Surah Nisa, verse 119, when Iblis says to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and I will mislead them and I will ar arise in them desires 
and I will command them so they will slit the ears of the cattle and I will command them so they will change the creation of Allah. Is it the, is this ayah mm. referred to this time period, what's going on right now in the world? Mm. <laughs> to be honest with you, I haven't thought about that and you've just made me... I mean, the part which says, Allah, They will change the khalq of Allah. Certainly this could be applicable. But I have to think about this one. It's a very interesting question. Because in the ayah, Iblis also says, I will arise desires within them. And yes. right now the world is just basically behind desires. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. I mean, فَلْيُغَيْرُنْ the خَلْقَ اللَّهِ for sure. Because, I mean, they, they're trying to change the creation of Allah in different ways. But obviously, it doesn't apply فَلْيُبَتِّكُنَّ أَذَانَ الْأَنْعَامِ Where they will slit the ears of the an'am, the, the cattle and so on. That's different. So, but... but that part, فَلْيُغَيْرُنَّ خَلْقَ اللَّهِ I can see where you're making the connection. And it's a, it's a clever pondering of the Qur'an. I have to give it to you. It's very good. MashaAllah. Uh, yes, any other questions? Should we get one from the sisters? Yeah. Okay, so the sister's asking, if one has a non-Muslim friend who is a bai, can we still maintain friendship and pray for hidayat for them or will we be punished for associating with them? They are good people with bad habits. You know, Hamza made a very good point, which I want him to maybe add to, is that we're already buying into the idea that they're identifying with their sexuality. So they're saying that they are bisexual. What does this even mean? That they are sexually aroused by both people? According to studies, and I looked at, there's a book called What Do You... Uh, Tell me what you want. Okay, this is the name. Of, I don't really necessarily recommend reading this book. But I don't know why I said it to you. But just as an academic reference. Okay, as an academic reference. It's called Tell Me What You Want. It's all about the sexual preferences of the people. And I think it's the biggest study that was done, I think, on 4,000 people. And it's interesting. That's one thing. And another book, and I'll add these together, is A Billion Wicked Thoughts. Which is they use what people research on pornography on the internet to see what people are interested in. What is really interesting and striking is that in both books, this idea of heterosexual women, according to their framing, right? Heterosexual women are attracted to watching other women in a sexual capacity is very rife, apparently. But they don't identify as bisexual. I mean, for example, many people today, I mean, we are all morally against homosexuality in all of its forms. But if many of the people today were to watch two women, sorry to say I'm being explicit about this, two women performing sexual acts, they may be aroused. One person I know was telling me that he was discussing the matter with lesbians and so on, and they said, forget about all the arguments, just take a look at this, and they showed him something, and he could never forget it afterwards. Like he saw the, the image and he could never forget the image. As a man, obviously as a man we believe that lesbianism as a Muslim man is haram. But it struck some kind of desire in him. Okay, yani, it's uh, not a big deal because it wasn't his fault or whatever. But then when he came out to do the lectures and he started talking about the LGBT community, he started saying, the GBT community! And then the brother was like, you forgot something here. <laughs> Which is the L. <laughs> It was, it was the best form of da'wah, which was no da'wah at all. But the point is, is, just because someone has these tendencies, it doesn't remove them, make them a mubtada' or make them a fasiq, or make them a kafir. If they are acting upon that, that's different. To be honest, even if they're telling you about them, it's problematic. To be honest, I mean, if they're telling you, I have this, I like men and women, for, that shows a ty type of fujur and fusuq, actually. But just, I mean, for the sake of argument, that can be something you can refer to your ulama if that's what the situation is. But if they are acting upon them, then you cannot really associate with this. Imagine shaking their hands and then you don't know what they're doing. Or hugging them and they have one feeling and you have another feeling. And why do you think that you can be safe from the fitna? Like, sorry to say, a woman can be tempted by another woman very easily. It can happen. And the evidence shows that a lot of heterosexual women can be tempted sexually by, uh, by lesbian women and bisexual women. 
How do you know one day she's not going to do something that you're going to react to in a certain manner? You say, no, I, I don't feel like this now. But you don't know. So it's a fitna. If the person is practicing the thing, I would say, then you have to have a very... Uh, if it's not a Tao relationship, then it shouldn't be any relationship. But if they're not practicing, if they're coming to you as for counsel and they want to help and this and that, then maybe you refer them to a counselor or something. Or help them out. Maybe refer them to something or... Because you, you guys still have conversion therapy. It's still legal here. It's not even legal in the West. Maybe they can go and speak to a Muslim counselor and that they can remove and expunge these thoughts from their minds and brains. It's a possibility. So I think that really, if you want a hukum, go to your local ulama. However, if it's somebody that is openly doing both of things, it's too much of a fitna. You don't need a alam for that. You know that that's wrong to be with that person. It's like having a gay friend, Liane. You're going to meet them all the time. You don't know what they're thinking, what they're doing. Taking pictures of you, so let's take a picture together. And what he does when he go home, he says, "Look at that picture." And what he's thinking, what he's feeling, or what she's thinking, what she's feeling. You're facilitating their fusuk and fujur. So uh, that's what I would say, Allah Alam. Would you would you add in? Is that okay? Yeah. Yes, sir. And the thing is, you need to realize just to echo off what Hijab said about your relationship should be one of da'wah, because in Islam there's a distinction between loving of and loving for. So we don't love of kuffar, meaning we don't love non-Muslims from the point of view that we love their disbelief. But we love for them. And you want goodness and guidance for them. So your relationship, if there's going to be one, is that you want goodness and guidance for them. And the goodness and guidance comes from where? Islam. How do you bring them to Islam? You give them da'wah. And that's how you should frame the relationship. However, there are also conditions, but speak to your local ulama. But generally speaking, some of those conditions include that in the process of giving da'wah, they're not giving da'wah to you to the degree that you basically come closer to their ideology. Yeah? Because there is a way of dealing with that shubha, that destructive doubt or that issue, by actually distancing yourself, removing away from the source of the shubha, which is sometimes very important, especially if you don't have the skills, the tools, or if your heart is a little bit weak. So it, it is context-based, but generally speaking, your relationship should be one of da'wah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Assalamu alaikum. to the responses given to the marriage of Sayyidah Aisha radiallahu anha with the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa First thing was mentioned that if there is no force or coercion or any dislike from either side, it would be okay. But um, wouldn't that be similar to the harm theory? And the second thing is that um, if, it's, if it's correct according to the orf and orf changes over time, wouldn't that be the same thing as a historical change? Hence, going back to the secondary argument as opposed to the primary argument. Zakumullah khairan. Yes, it, it, that's a very good question, in fact, because we need to differentiate between the harm theory of liberalism and the maxim which says, la darar wa la dirar, which is actually a hadith of the Prophet, by the way. It's a hadith which is in the 40 hadith of Nawawi, la darar wa la dirar, and another narration, la darar wa la idrar. There is no harming or reciprocating harm, and they've made this into a maxim, which is, a dararu yuzal, that darar or harm is to be averted, okay? Now, this darar yuzal is not to be used against the qat'i nas. Let me ex explain what I mean. Effectively, if you do jihad, or if you do a physical struggle, okay, you will get harmed. Or the chances of you getting harmed is very high. No one can say, well, there's a maxim in Islam which says, la darar wa la dirar, which overrides the nas, which is the clear text of the Qur'an. يعني كتب عليكم القتال وهو كره لكم وعساء أن تكرهوا شيئا وهو خير لكم وعساء أن تحبوا شيئا وهو شر لكم والله أعلم وأنتم لا تعلمون القرآن which is that you كتب عليكم القتال وهو كره لكم that the fighting has been prescribed upon you and it is disliked for for يعني you dislike it and you could dislike something which is good for you and you can hate something which is bad you can you can you can hate something which is good for you and you can dislike something which is bad for you and Allah knows and you don't know which shows you what? Which shows you that you cannot use this principle to override the nas. But this principle is used in conjunction with the nas. So for example, in situations like this, where you, you, in marriage and stuff like that, sometimes you require urf. It's true. So to see, is it possible, is it not possible? Because for example, Al-Qadi ibn Ayyad, he mentions very clearly that when is it that the woman, he's a Malik scholar, he says that when is it, and the many other scholars like him, when is it that the woman, because you can effectively do the betrothal before the person becomes prepubescent, like the Prophet did when she was six. It doesn't mean that he was actually 
Yani being intimate with her and stuff like that, as you guys know, right? But you can do that. And by the way, some scholars say you can do that with a boy as well, actually. Yani you can marry a boy to a girl and a girl a boy, but when they get older, the scholars say that, you know, you can, they, they have a chance and they use, for example, some scholars use the hadith of al-bikru to step them. That the virgin is to be asked and so on. But that's a different story. The point of the matter is this, is that uh, these situations, they say, they all use an Arabic word, taqa, or istita'a, or qudra. These are just interchangeable words meaning ability. That's the word they use. It seems therefore that the dabit or the principle at play for marriage in particular, according to scholars, and this is before liberalism or anything, was in fact, when the woman is capable to have sex, then, she's cap- then she will have sex. Some will argue, when is she capable of having sex? Well, Allah says in the Quran, ask the people of knowledge if you don't know. The family knows, the doctors know, the psychologists know, they can make an estimation. Taqdeer. And that's why the Prophet said in the hadith, Man wa lam yakum wa Whoever tries to be a doctor and he's not a doctor and he, is, and he harms somebody, he is actually responsible for that. Man tatabba min tib. The Arabic word tib. Literally, Islam is one of the only religions which actually gives some level of authority to doctors. So it's just true to say that yes, the, 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 there is a harm principle in Islam, but it's not the same harm principle as these guys. Because these guys, they're making it the ultimate morality. For us, the ultimate morality is qala wa qala rasul. This is subsidiary in conjunction with the ultimate morality. And it's used to inform the ahkam rather than to create them. And for them, the harm principle is you're creating the hukum from this. It's true that it's an area of similarity in the sense that both liberalism and Islam talk about harm, physical and psychological harm. But liberalism bases its entire tradition or moral theory based on it. Islam uses it to refine or inform pre-existing divine commands that have been said by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Is that answer your question? Oh yeah, the Urf, by the way, this issue with the Urf, the Urf Muhakkam, which is one of the things of the mentioned by the scholars, and Usul Fiqh. The first of all, the Urf is based on Islamic civilization. It's not, the Urf is not never the Urf of the Kaf, the, the, the Kufar. Because I know the word Kafir has some different implications, so I thought it was Kafir in the Arabic language means disbeliever, by the way. But the Kufar, okay? Which means you cannot say, well, the Urf Muhakkam, therefore, civilization has changed, therefore we must adjust ourselves based on civilizational change. It's based on those areas of the Sharia, which are not Qat'i already, and which inform certain processes and transactions, mu'amalat, and it's only based on the Islamic one. Not the, the Islamic civilization, not the non-Islamic civilization, but the ijma' of the scholars. No one says you can follow. In fact, there's a hadith that says, uh, I'm not going to mention the hadith because the word kafir, but, but, he's there. but it says, it's tashabbuh hadith. It's talking about com- comparing or, or, or trying to imitate the disbelievers. Some scholars say, qusu sharab, uh, narrations. Grow your beard and trim the mustache and differentiate yourself from the Jews and the Christians. Differentiate yourself. So clearly, Islam wants to differentiate itself from the customs of the other civilizations. Does that answer your question? Okay, uh, this is going to be the last question. Sorry to everyone. I know there were many more questions. Uh, so the sister is asking, how do we work with other religious groups on these issues, probably LGBT and stuff? Because obviously there are people of, uh, of other faiths that find themselves in this sort of conundrum, especially amongst the minority faith communities who still believe in traditional values. But at the same time, they might still change their views over time, whereas we have ijma. So how do we go about working with them? How do we do it? What do we do in that situation? I mean, to be honest with you, I, the idea of working with others is, is already, I feel, uh, almost a defeatist mentality. Not, not to say it shouldn't be done in some capacity, but I'm just saying that I don't necessarily like the idea of working with and joining hands and stuff like that. Because look, if you look in the history of the world, you'll find that we are strongest when we are self-dependent and self-sufficient. I'm not giving a hukum here, because this could be a hukmi thing, a fiqhi thing. The scholars may differ. I talk about interfaith discussions and all that. I'm not even talking about this. I'm just talking about the, 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 the nas here. I'm talking about the discussions, the 
of the scholars and of Allah and the Messenger. Like, for example, Prophet Muhammad said in the Hadith, the Sharaf al Ummah. The Sharaf of the Ummah is Qiyamahum Bil-Layl, standing in, in the night times. And the Izzah of the Ummah is istighna'uhum an nas is self sufficiency from people. So we should, the Prophet said, Al Yad al Ulya Khairum al Yad Sufla. The upper hand is better than the lower hand. Working with people, sometimes it necessitates that we, we have to fulfill their conditions. That we have to please them. That we have to say things which we can't be as free in our discussion. It necessitates that we have to do tawalli of them sometimes, even worse. Some people, they, they, there are issues here. There's not, I'm not necessarily advocating this. America in the 1920s and 30s, they had a policy of isolationism. And this policy led to their growth. So when they entered into World War II, they were able to dominate and actually get the Allies to win. But had it not been for their self-sufficiency and their self-dependence, they wouldn't have been able to do that. It's the mentality. I'm not talking about the hukum, whether it's halal or haram. That's not my business. It's above my pay grade. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the mentality that we must have is a mentality of self-sufficiency. A mentality of self-dependence. And so, actually, in terms of politics, it's a political decision not to oppose somebody. So, for example, if there's a conservative group of Christian people that are also anti-whatever anti it is, uh, homosexual policies or whatever, the encouragement of the children, all that stuff, and or Jewish people, I'm not sure if they've got a big minority of Jewish people here, or any other, even African traditionalists, whoever it may be, who are advocating anti-whatever is policies, it's a political decision not even to disturb them or attack them. You're allowing them, not attacking them as a decision as much as attacking them or, or uniting with them as a decision or collaborating with them. So in terms of formal collaborations where we share podiums and stuff like that, and we hold hands and all those kind of things, it has its advantage and it has its advantage, but in terms of the fiqhi ruling, you'd have to refer to your local ulama, and I know it's a contentious issue. Jazakallah to everyone for attending and we really would like to thank our guests for the sacrifice they made for sharing with us this ilm and experience. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless them in this world and the hereafter. And uh, on behalf of IPCI, we just have some gifts for both the brothers. On behalf of Alan Sar, sorry about that, I'm not sure what's inside there. Uh, yeah, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> So, Jazakallah to everyone for attending, and I hope you guys benefited. I really, really did. <laughs> so, we're going to, I think, 10 more minutes for tea, and then we're going to go for the Isha Salah uh, next door uh, in, in the, in the Jamaat Khan at Al Ansar. Right. Assalamu alaikum.